how many of you understand, have known or know anything about what is fusion? What is fusion energy? Shunecho, Kunadin. Yes. What is it? Great. Okay. So, this talk will be mostly about this uh, fusion energy, what we are doing. And there is a project called ITER, which is uh, the largest science and technology project in the world today. So, I will uh, describe about ITER project. Yes. Uh, in some parts, the talk may be a slightly higher level than, uh, than school. So, if you don't understand anything, please stop me and ask me what it is. Okay? Okay. So, I will first say about why uh, we want to do fusion. Basically, it comes from the you know, energy needs that we have uh, in India and also around the world. Some basics of fusion, then why we would like to do it here. Uh, and then I will give a brief overview of the machine, what is the status of the project, and what are the challenges, because every science and technology project, you know, has challenges. There is no project which doesn't have challenges. And you don't learn unless you face challenges. So I will say about that and then finally summarize. So first I say about the energy scenario. Do you know how energy is produced? Like how is the electricity produced in... Uh, in India, for example, what fraction of energy is, say, comes from? Raise your hand, one person at a time. Please raise your hand. You yeah. Yes. How? How? What fraction is from fossil fuels? Great. Close. I will say that slightly later. But first, you can see that uh, you need, for a good quality of life, you need a lot of energy. This is a plot which shows, you know what is the United Nations? All of you know. And you know what is Human Development Index? Oh, great. That is basically a uh, Human Development Index says you the status of human life. So the higher the Human Development Index, the better is your quality of life. So what is plotted here is the Human Development Index versus the per capita energy consumption. And you can see that the more usually the countries like US and Canada, they consume a lot of energy, use a lot of energy, because the countries are naturally very cold. So during the winter especially, there is a lot of heating that consumes most of the energy. But if you see the countries which are not so cold, like Australia, Netherlands, most of the European countries, they also consume a significant amount of energy, and which reflects in their quality of life. Like their human development index is close to one in most of these countries. The life expectancy in those years is more than 80 years. This is an old slide. Now it is almost close to 100 years in those countries. Whereas countries like India, which uh, consume much less energy, uh, it reflects also a reasonably poorer quality of life and a much lower life expectancy. And uh, India's you know, per capita energy consumption is about 1.12 kilowatt hour. You know how much is a kilowatt hour? You know what? You know kilowatt, 1,000 watt is one hour. Uh, what? When you use one, 1,000 watt for one hour, that is one kilowatt hour. That is the unit that electricity companies use for, you know, uh, billing your electricity bills. Now, that we, uh, was 2016, we used about 1.12 kilowatt hour per person per year, which is fairly less, which is almost half the average around the world, and about one-fourth of China, and one-tenth of the United States. Uh, but India is a developing country, uh, so it will grow. It has been actually growing quite fast. There's an old plot uh, about 2000, and uh, India is already uh, probably around this, uh, uh, this line. But the problem that India faces, and also China to a large extent, is our huge 
population. So any small increase in the per capita uh, in energy consumption means a large increase in the overall production of energy. And that tells you what is the energy scenario. The energy scenario as of today, may you say, lightly say it, is about slightly more than 70%, about 77% of energy today is produced from fossil fuels, basically coal, lignite, and gas. Very small amount, about 3% is uh, from nuclear. Hydro is about 10%, 10 to 11%. Residual, uh, uh, renewable energy sources, uh, which is wind and uh, solar, is uh, less than 10% now. We are import a small amount from Bhutan from hydro. <laughs> And this is what the Electricity Agency of India projects. They want to replace, I mean, in about 10, 11 years from now, is to replace a significant amount of uh, uh, fossil fuels through renewable sources. Like wind and uh, solar together is going to go up to about 35%. But it is very difficult to achieve that because the problem with wind and solar is they are not, first of all, energy dense. And they are not uniformly available throughout the year because if there is a cloudy weather, if there is rain, there is less uh, solar. And during the night, there is no production. Uh, similarly, if there is no wind, there is less of wind power. It is not like in you know, other sources like uh, uh, you know, nuclear or uh, thermal, uh, where throughout the year, there is a steady production. So what it means that if you want to have about 35% of uh, renewables, your installed capacity has to be much more. It needs almost like 60% of installed capacity needs to be in uh, renewables, which is very, very difficult to achieve and likely will fall short because, uh, in fact, uh, uh, the atomic energy had a vision meeting in 2000 in which Around 2020, the nuclear was projected to be about 15%. We are falling short seriously in that because of various reasons. It will go up only about 4% in another 10 years. But if you see that the, you know GDP, right? The gross domestic, domestic product. So India's GDP presently grows about 6%. Sometimes it goes to close to 8%. Or it can grow, but India has a lot of potential to grow even at 5%, even at 2050. And this is a statistical truth that the electric production, uh, electricity production grows about 1.2 of the GDP growth rate. For example, the energy consumption grew by about 8% in 2018, and it will uh, keep the similar pace. Now, the projection is that in, uh, even at 2050, uh, India may still produce 50% of its electricity from fossil fuels. And at this growth rate, this will be a very large increase in carbon footprint. So India produced about the CO2 emission in uh, 2000 was about 360 million tons of carbon, which we released to the atmosphere. It may actually go up to about 2,000 metric ton, uh, million tons in 2050. And that is the amount uh, which is about 30% of the global CO2 emission in 2000. So it is actually not sustainable. You know, nobody will allow you to, uh, you know, first of all, release so much of carbon dioxide into the uh, atmosphere. And you will not have even access to the resources for that. So especially in countries like India and China, we urgently need an alternate source of energy. And that is where, you know, fusion comes in. There is a lot of, you know, analysis which has gone on. Like, for example, in Western Europe, if you are carbon dioxide emission has to be restricted to, they uh, measured it in terms of PPM, okay? It is uh, uh, parts per million, how many uh, carbon uh, atoms per million of uh, uh, the air you have. So if you have to restrict that to 550, uh, right now it is about 800 or slightly more than 800. If you have to restrict that to 550 or 450, you need to have a significant amount of energy produced from alternate source like fusion. And similarly, there is a analysis for India, which has been done by a, a Professor Shukla from uh, Institute of uh, Management in Ahmedabad and his German colleagues from uh, Institute of uh, uh, Max Planck Institute in Germany. 
uh, which says that beyond 2050, if we have to restrict our uh, CO2 emission to 550 ppm, India will also need significant amount of fusion power or similar uh, if there is another breakthrough, basically an alternate source of energy, which is non-carbon dioxide. And so fusion is very energy dense, uh, you know, a very small amount of fuel actually produce a vast amount of energy. And the resources are accessible to all because uh, what you do in fusion is basically fuse uh, isotopes of hydrogen, which are deuterium and tritium. Deuterium is accessible to, uh, it is available even in this bottle of water, so has small uh, parts of deuterium, which can, you can separate through isotopically, you can separate. So it is available to everyone. And tritium you have to produce from lithium. Lithium is available in the earth's crust in abundance. So lithium can be converted to tritium through neutrons. So the resource is accessible to all. So most of the you know, political conflicts or uh, wars which you see saw in the last century or even in this century which were driven basically by because of access to energy, access to oil, will not be there if you have uh, you know, the resources available equally to all. Fusion is very clean. There is uh, very little carbon dioxide. In, in fact, here you can see a it produces a little bit of carbon dioxide, but that is mainly uh, through the materials which are needed to produce, you know, to make a fusion reactor. When you make those, you, you do produce a certain amount of carbon. It, it, only through that it comes. Uh, uh, the fusion is even lower, and uh, water is, almost, of course, lowest. So, but these are very low carbon dioxide footprint it, um, it has. And unlike, for example, the light water fission reactors which exist today, uh, fusion uh, will have very, very manageable radioactive waste. Uh, what it means that in the present fission reactor, the biggest problem is how you store the spent fuel, which is uh, radioactive and you have to store it beneath water or beneath you know, uh, earth in closed containers for a very long time. Uh, for example, the iodine, which is one of the most toxic isotopes uh, in fission reactors, has a one million year life. So it doesn't, their radioactivity do not reduce in one million years. So essentially you have to store them infinitely for their entire lifetime. Whereas in uh, f fusion reactors, you can have use materials which are low activation which has a half-life of about 100 years. So if you can store them for 100 years, it's good enough, and you can release it to atmosphere. Okay. And this is another plot of the same. The United Nations, again, says that for sustainable development uh, goals, one of the goals is to affordable to um, clean energy, uh, which is key to have a better quality of life. Now, there is already abundant amount of fusion in the, in, um, uh, in the universe. You know, the sun is a fusion reactor. Uh, it basically fuses hydrogen, pure hydrogen, into uh, heavier materials. How it does that is because of the enormous gravitational uh, pool the, earth ham, uh, the sun has over its own particles. So if you go to the core of the sun, the actually the hydrogen density is close to that of stainless steel. It is very highly dense because of the gravitational mass. And that, it, that helps it to fuse it very easily uh, at a reasonable temperature. And the fusion reactors have actually has higher temperature than the core of the sun. And uh, basically it fuses, you know, either hydrogen. I'll show you all the fusion uh, reactions. Basically when you combine two light nuclei, uh, there is a difference of mass between the reacting uh, particles and the resultant particles, and the difference of mass is, is released through energy, through E equal to mc square. We don't have to tell you that equation who wrote that. And, but the big challenge is to, you know, produce such fantastic amount of temperature in a uh, fusion plasma in a laboratory. And that is done through a uh, fusion machine. We have the best fusion machine today is called a tokamak. It is a Russian name. Uh, in English, it means toroidal chamber with magnetic cause. It was first invented in the so old Soviet Union, but now many countries uh, have built tokamak after that. 
And this is someone with basics. So you, you can see that the simplest of fusion experiments that you can do in the laboratory, you cannot do hydrogen fusion in the laboratory. It, it takes enormous amount of temperature and uh, uh, density to, uh, to build up a hydro, pure hydrogen fusion. But what you can do is deuterium and tritium, deuterium, 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 helium-3, and so on. Now, the easiest one to have is deuterium tritium. I don't know whether you know this kind of curves. This just shows you a cross-section of uh, fusion reactions versus the basically the temperature of the reacting particles. Uh, so the lower uh, the temperature is and the higher the peak is, is easier to have. So you can see the deuterium tritium, which is this, the peaks at a reasonably lower temperature of 100 kilo electron volt. You know what is a 100 kilo electron volt? How much is an electron volt in terms of centigrade or Kelvin? 1 electron volt is 11,600 11, Kelvin. So you can see that if you have 100 kilo electron volts, it is 110 to the power 3.1 uh, million times 11,600. That is the temperature you produce, uh, you have to produce in a reactor. That is why it is so difficult. Uh, you have to have in a laboratory, a temperature which is 10 times, roughly 10 times the core of the sun. And that is why it is techn technologically very, very difficult to achieve. But why I listed uh, these, uh, you know, DT is the easiest to have, but the problem with the deuterium tritium is that it also produces a neutron, a very high energetic 14 MeV neutron, which when hits any uh, wall of the reactor, it makes the wall radioactive. And so there is a lot of radioactivity involved. So you have to use special kind of uh, stainless steel, for example, or other materials, which are low activation materials, to uh, deal with that, to reduce your radioactivity or radioactive waste, because they are, when they are bombarded with neutrons, they become radioactive. But if you see uh, the last reaction, the proton with uh, a boron, or uh, say a deuterium with the helium-3, they are absolutely no aneutronic. What is aneutronic is they don't produce any neutrons. So it produces only a helium and a proton or a helium and uh, an energy. And that is fantastic because then there is no radioactive involved, radioactivity involved. So they are essentially non-nuclear uh, reactions, non, you know, radioactive reactions. And if you can achieve that, which is very, very difficult to achieve because they occur at much higher temperatures, uh, you, you can actually have very, very, very clean energy. But some future fusion, you know, human uh, life may be able to do that. Present technology doesn't allow you to go to those temperatures. Okay. The biggest, you know, science and technology uh, challenge of this human civilization is actually how to have, how to do a fusion, uh, you know, a controlled fusion reaction in the laboratory. People have done uncontrolled fusion reactions like. The hydrogen bombs is a fusion reaction. It comes through uh, hydrogen uh, deuterium and tritium basically, but it is not controlled. It is an uncontrolled blast. So people have, in you know, humans have done uncontrolled fusion, but controlled fusion in a lab environment in a confined way is extremely difficult to do. Uh, that is what scientists are trying to do through the tokamak. So in a tokamak, uh, a deuterium and tritium Basically, you start with the gas and start hitting the gas. It becomes into the fourth state of matter, which is the plasma. And then you heat the plasma to very high temperature. As I said about 150 million degrees centigrade. Sun's core is about 15 million degrees. So that is why it is about 10 times the core of the sun. And then the hot plasma then basically because uh, when they are at such high temperatures, they collide with each other, they fuse and produce uh, helium and neutrons. And the neutrons is then absorbed in the surrounding walls uh, and produce heat. And that heat can be converted through a normal uh, steam turbine uh, into electricity in a conventional way. Uh, and also the neutrons are also absorbed, uh, that is a little bit more technical, uh, into uh, the blankets which are contain lithium and produce their own uh, tritium by uh, you know, converting the lithium into tritium. So you make your own fuel into the reactor itself. And this is how a, a cartoon of a tokamak is. 
it is basically what you do in a tokamak is confine uh, because you, uh, as I said uh, in the sun the confinement you can confine such a hot plasma through gravitational uh, pool uh, but in earth you cannot pr produce such a gravitational pool so you have to confine it through magnetic fields because in the magnetic fields the charged particles are confined because they move along the magnetic lines of force. So a tokamak uh, is basically a magnetic cage and uh, it contains several kinds of magnets. Uh, you will find in the uh, later on in the presentation that there are something called toroidal magnets which is basically a uh, kind of a solenoid. If you take a long solenoid, you know what is a solenoid, right? If you take a long solenoid and just turn it around into a circle, it becomes a torus. So that is what has been done. It is a solenoidal coil which has been turned to close onto itself because then in the center, if you form a plasma, they will go on and circulate inside and will not move out of the machine. And that is how you confine those particles. There are also other confining fields which is required, which are these circular coils, which are called poloidal field coils. Then there is a central solenoid which uh, uh, drives a current in the plasma because you need to drive the current also you know, to produce a helical field instead of a straight circular field. This helical field is the best to confine the plasma and don't let it escape from inside the vacuum. There is a vessel inside which you keep them and don't, the idea is there is a, a large vessel, this uh, steel colored thing is a vessel. Uh, it is a large stainless steel vessel inside which you produce a, a vacuum uh, with a little bit of deuterium and tritium injected inside. Then you, uh, you know, basically break down that into a plasma and drive a current uh, and produce this, you know, kind of magnetic structure. And the idea is this plasma should never touch the wall because if it touches the wall, it will simply melt the wall because of the temperature. So you basically suspend the pl uh, plasma in a uh, in thin air uh, through a magnetic field and when you heat them to very high temperature like I said 150 degrees uh, 150 million Kelvin or centigrade they basically fuse and produce fusion. So that is what the docomics do. For example if you see uh, I'll come to ITER a little bit more but this is just to give an example of the magnets in ITER. Uh, ITER also has this uh, toroidal field magnets which are the ones which is yellowish color here. Uh, the solenoid and then there are the circular coils which are called poloidal field coils and then there is a central solenoid. The central solenoid is uh, very large in ITER. Uh, it is about 13 meters in height, uh, weighs about 1000 tons and it is very powerful. It can, the amount of energy it stores can actually lift an aircraft carrier out of water. Uh, it stores that much of energy. Then there are you know, these are more technical, there are many number of coils. Basically these coils are required to create a magnetic cage inside which you produce the plasma and heat it to fusion relevant temperatures. Okay, and it is real, it is not for, you know, just for show. This is an existing tokamak called Joint European Taurus, a jet in Cullum in England. And uh, this is the most successful tokamak so far. And this has actually produced about 16 megawatts of electric M of uh, fusion energy uh, at what is called a less than break even because you know idea is in a fusion reactor it will only be successful to produce energy if you produce this a net amount of energy. So the amount of energy you uh, produce to fusion has to exceed the amount of energy you need to make the fusion itself, okay. These reactions, existing all reactions has operated at slightly below one, okay, about point, uh, this jet experiment was about 0.65, so it is slightly below one. But overall, if you see from the late 60s, uh, the T3, the uh, Tumen 3, which is a, was a, one of the first Russian tokamaks, it produced the first 1 keV of temperature in a fusion reactor. Uh, from there, you know, JET has uh, proceeded quite significant, uh, significantly today and ITER is going to exceed that. It is, uh, what is plotted for fusion is actually the product of plasma density and temperature and it is more uh, technical so I will not go into the details. But if you compare the, you know, the achievements of fusion with say computer chips or 
so the accelerators, uh, Fusion has actually done a pretty good job. It has actually exceeded uh, other you know, developments. And uh, ITER is going to be the first machine to produce a net amount of energy. I'll show it in a while. This is a historical perspective that uh, uh, when JET achieved the first uh, you know, DT reaction, there were two tokamaks, not just JET. JET achieved in 1990s so more than 20 years from now, uh, about 16 megawatts of fusion power. Uh, TFTR was a, um, another tokamak in Princeton in the United States. It produced about 10 megawatts in uh, one of the best experiments. Uh, but however, as I said, that both machines uh, you know, required more energy to produce than what it produced uh, through fusion. And ITER is the first machine to, uh, uh, a Q is the ratio of the output fusion energy divided by the input energy. So Q has to be exceed 1 if you want to have, have a you know, fusion reactor beneficial to it. In fact, Q has to be much more greater than 1 for a fusion, actual fusion reactor, Q needs to be around 30 at least. And ITER is the first machine to, which will try at Q greater than, 10, uh, greater than or equal to 10. And that is going to prove that fusion works. Okay. And also, you know, uh, you need to have very large machines uh, because uh, uh, this is a little bit more technical. Maybe I should not, I should skip this for you. Uh, uh, basically, what it says is that you need to go to very large size machines uh, to have enough fusion output. So, uh, for example, uh, Tor Supra, which is called West now, is a tokamak in France, which was about 25 meter cube of plasma volume. It didn't produce any fusion. Uh, fusion. And uh, compared to that, Jet, which is about three times, or slightly more than three times of Tor Supra, about 80 meter cube in plasma volume. It produced the best 16 megawatts of power, but consumed about 23 megawatts. So that is why 0.65 is the ratio of this fusion power by heating power. But compared to ITER, it is very large. It is gigantic. It is about 10 times the size of JET. And uh, it will produce 500 megawatts of fusion power and consume about only 50 megawatts. So that is why the fusion gain will be this divided by this, which is at least about 10. Okay, and, uh, and the plasma current, you also need a large plasma current uh, to confine the plasma, so it will be about 15 megaamps. There is a historical perspective how, uh, when it started ITER. The, the initially, the project started long time back in 1986. Uh, it is the end of the Cold War. You know who, who these people are? That is a GK question. Who are these people? They're famous. One is a film actor, was a film actor rather, and a president. Now it is much, much older than Putin. Well, he is Ronald Reagan. I don't know whether you have heard. Probably he was a president before you were born. Okay. And this is Gorbachev, he was a president of the United States. So this, this is the end of the Cold War when they decided that they will build it. Eh? And then it became a collaboration. Initially it was a collaboration between US, Japan, Russia and, uh, uh, and Europe. And then uh, other parties joined, then Korea and China joined in 2003. And we joined in uh, 2005, December. And this is a, this was the first, you know, uh, uh, ITER agreement which was signed. You can see the President Mitterrand, which was the French president. I don't know whether you know this person here. He is Anil, Dr. Anil Kakotkar, who was the chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission at that time, and he signed the ITER agreement. So what ITER wants to do is, uh, basically, it is a unique mega science and engineering experiment. It will demonstrate virtually limitless, safe, and environmentally friendly energy source from hydrogen isotopes through fusion. That is the goal of ITEL. And as I said, India became the seventh partner to join the project in 2005. There are seven countries. Seven in Europe is as a whole is the one country. There's China, India, Japan. A little bit quiet. 
You can ask me questions any point of time, as I said. Yeah, please. Sir, if you can go back to the magnetic kit slide, why are we using both the solenoid as well as the coax mirror? Wait. Let me check how I can go back. Uh, Yeah, just a moment. This is, where are we? This is before this. Sorry, I didn't, I put a number, but not everybody. Uh, I don't have the, yeah. This one? Okay. Yes. Uh, why are we using both the central solenoid as well as the toys? Okay. Yes, you need them both. Uh, the purpose of the toroidal coils is to produce what is called a toroidal field. Okay, the actual field which goes around the torus and closes onto itself. And the solenoid has two purposes. Uh, solenoid drives a current in the plasma. Okay. Uh, because through a uh, transformer action. So it is a transformer primary and the plasma is a secondary. So if you change the flux in a, you know, how transformer works, if you change the flux in a, in a primary, the uh, a current will drive in the secondary. So that is how a, drive, a current is driven in the plasma. That current both hits the plasma initially as well as it produces also the polaroidal field which also helps in confining the plasma. So to create the magnetic bottle, proper magnetic bottle, you need both to drive a current as well as a toroidal field. So that is the purpose of the... So the toroidal field is, bas the toroid is basically for giving the field only to cage it. Actual field. No, uh, cage is both because of the solenoid as well as the toroidal field. Right. And the solenoid is only uh, to pass the uh, to current. To pass the current. The current helps in creating the... See, the current uh, in the plasma itself will generate a field around the, uh, around the current. So that current along with the uh, actual current, actual field, that field along with the actual field creates a helical field and that creates the perfect bottle. Thank you. Okay. Any other question or I can go ahead? Okay. If it is boring, tell me. There's not a problem. Uh, this also I have said. The e Eater has several goals. Uh, the first goal, as I said, was to produce Q equal to 10. So it will produce about 500 megawatts of fusion power through 50 megawatts of input power. So this is the first machine to exceed uh, the energy it produces than what it consumes. And also it will uh, demonstrate like, you know, in a reactor you cannot uh, operate. Uh, today's tokamaks, they mostly operate for a very short time, about few seconds at best. So ITER will be the first machine to, you know, first operate at uh, Q equal to 10 for about 400 seconds. And in really steady state uh, for several thousand seconds at Q equal to 5. Okay, and why we are participating is in ITER is also, okay, this is a little bit technical. I'll skip this one. This is again a historical perspective. Uh, uh, this also is not required. Okay, what we do in ITER is actually ITER is uh, broken. The entire ITER machine is broken into several components. And India being an uh, equal partner produce, uh, gives about 1 11th. Yeah, Europe gives about 5 11th, okay, about 46%. And India uh, gives about 1 11th, which is about 9% of the ITER total cost. And the cost is not given in money. We actually make components of the machine in India and uh, ship it there which, for the final machine to be built. And the entire machine into, is uh, broken down into several components and divided into the various partners to, do, um, uh, to build the machine and uh, to build the components and finally build the machine. And there is something called an organization, international organization and a domestic agency. Uh, the international organization sits in France. Uh, the France is the headquarters where ITER is being built. Uh, and like us, we are the domestic agency, like ITER India is a domestic agency, uh, which basically procures the uh, uh, components, makes, uh, manufactures it to its industries, and deliver it there through certain quality. And there is a, uh, the roles are very well defined into both of these. Then these are the various components which uh, India is producing for ITER. Like we have what is called a cryostat, 
which is basically a large uh, stainless steel vessel, large means very large. It is about 30 meters tall. 30 meters is like a 10 story building. Uh, a vacuum vessel of that size and the uh, radius is also, uh, the diameter is also about 30 meters. So it is a 10, uh, 10 story by the, um, up and 10 story horizontally, that size of a building, uh, that size of a uh, stainless steel vessel, which has to be you know, under very ultra high vacuum. Uh, because you need vacuum inside because uh, you stored the magnets. The magnets are cooled by uh, liquid helium. So they are superconducting magnets. And then we are a certain amount of, you know, you, have to, you need to also do diagnostics of various plasma properties. So certain amount of diagnostics we procure. Then something called vacuum vessel involved shields, which are basically to absorb the neutrons from the, with that uh, the fusion reactions produce. Uh, these are basically blocks of special stainless steel material. Then the entire you know, water cooling system of ITER is divided into 50-50 between India and China. So about 50% of the water cooling systems India is uh, providing. Then there is a, one of the four neutral beams. ITER has four neutral beams, three for heating and one for uh, diagnostics. The diagnostic neutral beam India is, uh, the neutral beam is like a full accelerator. It is a uh, accelerator which accelerates charge particles of hydrogen, but you can, uh, in a tokamak because of the magnetic field you cannot inject charge particles. So you neutralize the charge particles into a neutral beam and inject the neutral neutralized particles into the plasma. And that is basically used to heat the plasma or in this case the diagnostics. It will also heat a little bit. Then there are, you know, the plasma is heated uh, by either neutral beams or through radio frequency, you know, microwaves. Uh, these are very high powered microwaves, uh, radio frequency waves, that waves, you know, transfer their energy from the wave to the plasma particles. So that in the, they are at various, you know, frequencies, they either resonate with the electrons or the ions. So they are called ion cyclotron or electron cyclotron, uh, you know, uh, radio frequency sources. Uh, like these use uh, tetrode tubes or diacrode, which is uh, come a different kind of a tetrode, and these use gyrotrons, these are basically sources. And then there are various power supplies, and the cryo distribution and cryo line is basically uh, kind of uh, you know pipes and various other components which carry the liquid helium from a helium plant, uh, a cryogenic pl cryo plant to the magnets. The magnets are cooled by liquid helium. Okay, these are the standards of various components which are being built around the world. Like India is producing these cryolines, the cryostat, the, this is the lower uh, cylinder of the cryostat. And China is making the correction calls. Then the thermal shields are being made in Korea. Uh, there's a central solenoid. You uh, are the central solenoid. This is the central solenoid which is being made by the United States. And uh, there is a neutral beam uh, uh, activity at uh, Italy, which is a part of ITER uh, for developing the neutral beam uh, beams and do the R&D. So this is a, a spider component of the neutral beam. And then there are twaddle field coils. You can uh, judge the size of a coil. These are the biggest magnets, superconducting magnets, high liquid helium cooled, made anywhere around the world. You can see there are about 30 people standing here inside a magnet. The magnet is this one, okay? These are really gigantic magnets which are being produced. Uh, this is made by both Japan and Europe. Then uh, Europe and Korea are making the vacuum vessel. Europe is also making, as I said, the part of uh, some of the toroidal field coils. This is again another toroidal field coil which will be delivered in a few months from now uh, to the ITER site. And this is one of the poloidal field coils, the circular coil, which is uh, being manufactured in China, but it is an European procurement, so both China and Europe are involved in that. And this is another poloidal field coil, which is being made in Russia. Similarly, there are vacuum vessel ports. Uh, this is a, what is called a diverter heat flux, because as I say, the tokamak uh, produces about 150 million so all the you know components around takes enormous amount of heat, and this takes uh, these are diverter uh, cassettes, uh, which takes a heat load of about I don't know whether you know these, these numbers resonate with you. It's about 20 megawatts per meter square. Just to give you an example, you know 
uh, the Challenger exploded uh, the spacecraft because when uh, be, during the re-entry, its heat shield failed. And those heat shields typically take about 10 megawatts per meter square. Uh, and ITER takes about twice, uh, ITER and diverters will take about twice that amount. So these are, you know, the technologies which have never been developed are being developed for ITER now. Uh, these are chillers and pumps which are being sent from India, which have actually been sent from India. And these are bellows which are even, uh, procured by the United States and being made, uh, made in Germany. And these are some uh, parts of the power supply which are called ACDC converters which are also made in China. Now there are many challenges. Uh, as I said, no, there is no science and technology project without challenge. So there are both scientific as well as technology challenges. I will not go into the details, but take it that every component in ITER is huge. It is of gigantic proportions. Please. In the HRD, it is training a lot of fusion scientists to cutting edge engineering. In a short, I will say that. Uh, it is developing a, uh, this is, uh, right now ITER is almost entirely engineering, 90% of it is engineering, and this is engineering at, at the highest level of cutting edge technologies. And it is, you know, developing the engineering skills, a lot of, you know, uh, engineers and scientists are being trained uh, in a very cutting edge technology to make fusion reactors, and developing almost, you know, uh, in ITER site, there are more than 1,000 people working, about uh, 30 from India right now. Uh, in fact, more than, much more than 30. It is actually close to 100 people from India are working now, uh, if you take um, all the employees and other contractor staff. So it is developing the HRD in a big way. And for you, as students, I will come to that later. Uh, what you can do, OK? And then. Uh, uh, these are very large. All of them are, mostly all of them are first of its kind. They have never been built and being built for ITER for the first time. And it also needs, uh, you know, precision at, at unprecedented levels. Very high level of precision is required. And there are quite a few scientific challenges because uh, these are more technical details. I will not go into the detail of that, which ITER has to manage. Then there are management challenges. Like, you know, ITER is made with, as I said, with seven uh, partners. Uh, Europe as a whole is a one partner. In Europe, there are 26 nations. So there are total about 32 nations. And they have different work cultures, uh, different habits, different lifestyles. And they all have to work together and produce components from the same machine uh, with the same quality, which is enormously difficult thing to do. So there's a lot of management challenge for that. And ITER is going to be the first nuclear machine. So it is a nuclear reactor, so there is a nuclear, nuclear licensing involved, which is also management wise quite challenging. Just to give an example, they have the heater size, you can see a human, which looks really tiny compared to, this is a, uh, uh, you know, assembly tool, uh, which is delivered from Korea. And uh, this is the magnet, which is it is handling. You can see the size of heater magnet, and a human is really insignificant compared to that. So these are, yes, please. So where's the main structure will be based? It, in, uh, in France. In south of France. So how the energy will be transferred in various countries? Sorry? How the energy or electricity will be uh, uh, ETERN is an experimental device. It will produce fusion with, and it will not convert that fusion energy into electrical energy. This is an, still an experimental device. For that, I probably showed in one of the plots, each country has a plan to make what is called a demo, a demo reactor. Demo will be the first reactors which will actually put electricity into the grid. So what ITER will do, just demonstrate that fusion works, because that has not been demonstrated so far. That fusion, you can get energy more than the input. Fusion has been demonstrated. Of course, JET has achieved fusion, but it has not achieved in a, a, an energy gain. ITER, ITER is the first machine to work and achieve an energy gain. Uh, it, is, it will produce 10 times the energy, but it will not convert that energy into electricity. Okay, that will not be done. It will be done in demo reactor, which is uh, still farther away. Yes. Sir, yes. so for producing, uh, to maintain the uh, plasma, we have been giving a lot, a huge amount of electricity is passed through the solenoid. Yes. So isn't that consuming a lot amount of energy? Like, is it possible to maintain that plasma state without passing that amount of electricity? Because ultimately, what we are finding is to go for a low. But 
maintain it at a scale no. yes. plasma. Yes. As I say that uh, energy gain is about 10. So you consume, uh, uh, this consumes, uh, was shown there is a heating power. The electrical power in the rest of the systems are uh, much less than that. So if you are heating about at about 50 megawatts, you will probably spend 10% of that, about 4 or 5 megawatts additional into the electrical, other electrical system, which is for him, uh, keep it, keeping the mag magnets uh, running. Uh, but that is required. If you stop the magnets, the energy, the fusion reaction will stop. You cannot confine you the plasma. Maintain the plasma state continuously. Yes, you have to maintain the plasma state the continuously. Amount of electricity to maintain yes. The plasma. So what you produce, you use only a small fraction of that and to maintain. Feedback. Yes. Okay. Okay. So this is the um, just an example of the gigantic size, and this is an example of the precision. Like you have, you know, 3D laser scanning metrology techniques, which is used which are at, at watch-like precision to you know, uh, precisely uh, place and build each and every component. Like this was done by uh, India. This is an Indian delivery of the Cryostat lower cylinder. Uh, and they are using 3D laser metrology to you know, see that uh, it is to the right size and shape. Uh, so both you need gigantic size as well as very high level of precision is required. Now these are again some details, there are management challenges, like there are, uh, these are the various layers of the building which will house it. Uh, I can see enormous amount of interfaces and to manage the interfaces there is always some change and those uh, manage, uh, those changes has to be managed properly, there are really large management uh, problems. But ITER is doing all that. So now if you see this is a, uh, this year's picture, so ITER side is getting ready. And the first plasma is uh, going to start in about six years from now. And this is what it was about five years before. It was basically, originally it was a hill, which was flattened in a, into a flat surface and some buildings are already built, you can see that. Uh, and then uh, you can see the site is almost now full. And it is going to be even fuller in another six years when you make the, uh, and this is the present very latest picture of the heater site. You can see this is a, uh, assembly hall like, or tokomak will be sitting here and these are various buildings like the attrition building the bar shields that uh, tokomak building is here and uh, various other components so the place is almost looking like full uh, and this is the schedule the first plasma operation is going to be in 2025 and the first there's a long way you have to go before you can actually turn on the dt there's a nuclear licensing process involved which is called mission service and uh, only after you get this um, uh, licensing you can do with the DT operations. So the DT operations will start something around 2025 or early 2036, 2035. Uh, and then you can get the actual diffusion energy output about at 10 times the input energy. So this is, is going to be a very exciting period when Inter achieves there. So to summarize, uh, the global fusion has uh, progressed really remarkably well. ITER is the next logical step. ITER is the first machine which will achieve Q equal to 10. That's okay, and then relax. And uh, there are significant challenges, of course, both scientific as well as technical and managerial. But ITER, they are being adequately addressed uh, to build ITER. ITER construction today is uh, in the just last month's update, is about 65% of the construction to first plasma is complete now. And first, machine will be operated in 2025, that is the first plasma and the first DT experiments at uh, Q larger, uh, large Q values will be in 2035. And that's all. Thank you. <laughs> questions? Quiz? I'll ask questions or you'll ask questions? You do the former. You ask questions, I will ask difficult questions. Yes, please. Sir, you said that high energy equipment is already about the energy for a long time. So how will you store that for about a bit? You don't store. Uh, basically, what happens is you uh, run the plasma experiment for very long times, like you know, several thousands of seconds. Uh, energy which is produced, it comes out in the form of neutrons. The neutrons you produce, the neutrons you cannot confine in a magnetic field. They escape because they are chargeless particles. 
So the neutrons come out and hit the surrounding blankets and the blankets get heated up. Okay, and that heat you dissipate through cooling, by water cooling. That is what India is supplying, the water cooling system. So that water takes away the heat from the machine and that heat, in a, you, know, you can run a turbine in principle and you know, convert that heat into electricity. And finally, the demo reactor will do that. But right now, that heat is just dissipated uh, in the atmosphere. So, sir, is it the energy being lost during the, when the neutron is hitting? Yes, the neutron, that is the whole idea. The, uh, the neutron has to lose their energy, have to lose their energy to the blankets uh, or shielding blankets or, uh, you know, tissue and bleeding blankets. And that is how you extract the energy out of because the t neutrons lose their energy, that is the fusion energy. They lose their energy to heat and then that heat is converted to electricity. Sorry, I can't hear you. Yes. Well, that is a little bit more technical. Uh, see, first of all, to do the fusion, you have to heat the plasma to very high temperature. Otherwise, it will not do fusion. Okay? There is no escape from it. Once you produce a very high temperature plasma, uh, the heat also escapes. It is not a perfect cage. Now, I said there is a magnetic cage, but it is not a perfect confinement. So some of the particles, they escape, and they heat the diverter or the surrounding walls and produce energy. So that takes the enormous amount of heat loads. So that has to be controlled. So controlling that is a challenge. Yes, yeah, please. You, thank you so much uh, for pleasure. enlightening our students. And I'm sure they have a whole lot of questions in their mind coming up. But we are also, you know, there's a little bit of paucity of time. Sure. We have to visit the exhibition. Yes, and please. then we have to make a move. Yes. So thank you again, sir, very much on behalf of all our students.